thank you for the opportunity as your people, Father God, to lift up your name. As your people to be reflective of the far or reflective of the light of you, Lord, in this world as your body here, Lord. I ask, Father God, that all of us here today, here completely and totally and openly, I pray that, Father God, your word grows beautifully in us, providing strength, inner strength, and outward testimony through witness, Father, of your goodness and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name I pray. Sister. God, you are, Lord, you are the God of miracles. Would you all not only speak your word, but to declare the light of your word, which is the light of life, to all those that would ask us why we have so much hope. Brothers and sisters, we're in a season in the natural way, thank you, sister. We're in a season in the natural way that everybody is seeking and looking <clears throat> to belong, to belong to someone and in the family and to, to feel that nurturing and that comfort and that acceptance and that general well-being, that love. We call it the Christmas season. But unfortunately, most of the time that this Christmas season that we live in is, is short-lived because it is exactly that. It is a season, a celebration, a secular celebration um, made religious by religion. But it is not what gives us true sense of joy. And I'm not minimizing what people are seeking. I just want to redirect that people seek the most important thing. It's not about a particular time in the year to feel this sense of, uh, of comfort and love, but every day in our lives. And the Lord God is not a seasoned God. He's an everyday God. He's a God that doesn't run out of help, doesn't run out of joy, doesn't run out of light. And seasons like this now, as we call the Christmas season, we see so many people, just as I've said, chasing after feelings and emotions, wanting to belong and, and feel that, that happiness, that sense of happiness, filled with love and with joy and well-being. The world can only counterfeit, the world can only duplicate, but it cannot create what we need. The world can't give to us what only Jesus can. You know, everything that I've been led to do here lately is to bring us back to the beginning. Because everything about who God is 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 before the beginning of time. And everything that he instituted is in the beginning, in the book of Genesis. And we acknowledge that as, as, as truth, infallible. It's not, it's not fallible. It's not no matter what people want to do, no matter what people want to tear apart, 
They cannot undo what God has ordained. And God has ordained that he is the light. He created light. And that's what I want to look at today. The name of the message that God has given me, the title will probably not do justice to what I'm trying to say. But if you listen to the message, um, then regardless of what the title is, you'll hear the truth of it. And that's the important thing. The name of the message that the Lord gave me is this. Keep choosing the real light. And you will never walk in darkness. Keep choosing the real light. And you will never walk in darkness. Everything, everybody, and all of us are drawn to the light. Especially when it's dark outside. Even in the natural. We're always looking to have a flashlight or security lights or lights to direct our paths at night in the darkness. So we know that darkness in itself is not compatible to who we are. Do you know why I know that? Because you see, in the Word of God in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and He called light to come forth. So, as I've done, and it saves time, but it also puts a responsibility on each and every one of you at home to do your research, to do your study, to rightfully divide the Word of Truth. So I'm going to give you several readings. Some of them I'll be able to share with you today and others you will take and do at home together as a family. At least I pray that you do. This is why I do this. The first reading that I want to have you write down is Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, which as I just said a moment ago, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and. Then we have John 1 verse 13, excuse me, uh, verse 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word. Again, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. This is, again, I'm giving you summations. I'm giving you nuggets. I'm not giving you the whole core. I'm giving you nuggets. And John 8, 12 is our text for today. Jesus said without apology who he is and what he will do for all who come to him and what we can expect to happen when we really do. He said that we will never walk in darkness. All the artificial lights and the counterfeit lights, whether they be Christmas lightings or whether they be lights that are in our homes or whether they be flashlights or whether they be fire, they all have to draw from a source in the light of our lives, and that's what Jesus was saying, in order to walk, never walk in darkness, we have to follow Him, because He is our source. The Word of God also says in Psalms 119, 105, that the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, for a reason, it's personal and it's directional. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, the word of the Lord says, we are the light of the world. And the reason for it is because of who we are in Christ. We are a city of people that are set apart, are, are separated unto the Lord. It says unto a hill, but that hill is the Lord, that rock that is higher than we are, so that we can be set apart unto him so that the people can see that we are separated, yet not isolated. When it says in this particular scripture on a hill, it means that we are called to a higher standard than the world. We're called to His standard. And because of that, we cannot be hid, and we cannot hide our light if we stay in Him. If we're truly walking in him, the light will not be hidden. And in John 10, 22 through 30, it speaks about Jesus at the feast of dedication or the feast of lights. It's referred to as Hanukkah. Again, this is John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. And it speaks about Jesus at the feast of dedication. It's also known as the feast of lights because of what he referred to. We know it in the Jewish custom. It's not 
as much a feast as a Jewish feast as a Jewish holiday known as Hanukkah, both spell with a C and with an H, depending on who's spelling it. And as I said, it's known as a feast of dedication. For us, it is not, as a people redeemed of the Lord, it is not a feast of dedication. I look to share with you, it is a feast of rededication for us. As I seek to parallel the times that we're in, very much so like the times that the Maccabeans rose up. Back in that time, as Brother Well expounded upon, it was about the temple of God, which was of stone. It was about the altar of God, which was of stone. It was about the one true God. It was about the Judeas and the worship of the one true God. And we know that, as Brother Well explained, Epiphanes the fourth, he was brutish and he was cruel. And uh, he was just, he was a murderer. Uh, Epiphanies in itself means the visual God. And uh, when they reduced it just to Epiphanies, what they were saying was they called him the madman for a reason. Uh, he did some horrendous things and I don't even want to talk about that. But the point I'm trying to make right now is I parallel that to maybe not to the extreme that we have right now, but spiritually, yes. Where the powers of the governing powers of this world are seeking to pollute the altars of God, are seeking to close the, the temples of God, to remove and, uh, and to cause the people of God, that claim to be the people of God, to put on the altars of their heart things of the world. Because the pork and the pig in itself was Hellenic. And in other words, it was it was of the of the Greek culture, and it's very much like today. It's of the world's culture that is trying to pollute the altar of the people of God. You say, well, Pastor, it, the pulpit is not not polluted. No, let me finish, because before we even look at the pulpit that is made of either stone or wood, the altar that I'm talking about is not the pulpit. The altar that I'm talking about is the heart of the Christian. And that's the platform, or if you will, the foundation that this message comes from for you and to me. So that we can understand the times that we're in and exactly what we need to do. Maybe not physically, but not limiting it to just spiritual. Because I believe that we need to make an obvious stance against that that is totally ungodly and perverted. I saw the other day where uh, uh, Kirk Cameron was refused the uh, right to go into the library and share the Word of God, to read the Word of God, where at the same token, they allowed drag queens to, to read in a story hour and present to the children their dynamics on different things. Now that that's, to me is perverted. I don't mind saying it on video. To me, that is so one-sided and, and it's very much, again, you might say, Pastor, you're an extremist. Well, maybe so, but I believe that if more people would have been a, an extremist in the time of Hitler, it wouldn't have been what it was. And again, I'm not political, but I'm being very real in what I'm saying spiritually. We need to take control of the light and the fire that's burning in us. Now I asked the two elders, two male elders I had this morning, I said, what do you think came first when the, in the Maccabean revolt? Do you think they sought to light the menorah first or they sought to clean the altar first? And really and truthfully, the, the reason why I'm bringing it to you, these you have to understand from whence I'm coming with this message, these people were already people of God. So it's not about dedication, it's about rededication. They had to see that there was a need to rededicate that that had been dedicated to God. And I'm talking about us, I'm talking about our homes, our lives, our hearts. The Maccabean people were one family that when the general who was sent by Epiphanes to, to ravage or just totally destroy the countryside, went to this little village where the, I think it was Matthias, who was the father of uh, several of the family clan, which uh, 
the Maccabeans, that's where it came from, the revolt. Maccabean, or Matthias being hammer or motto, that's where the hammer came from, the name of the hammer came from. Whereas they went to build an altar in this village. I see it very much like it today. They want to build their own altar to sacrifice them to the gods of the world. And this happened to be Zeus, okay, the god of this world, a counterfeit light, if you will. And when they got there, they got a hold of Matthias, the, the, um, the man that actually was over the whole village. And they tried to force him to build that altar and he refused. They tried to force him to do several things and refused and it ended up that when they came to slew him, he actually drew the sword and destroyed the, a bunch of the commanders and such and the, the whole village rose up and destroyed everything, pulled down the altar and all that. Uh, eventually he died because they tried to force him. He was a priest uh, uh, to the Lord and they tried to force him to eat the pig and they refused to and they even said listen you can be a holistic a Hellenist which is a Greek it is kind of like what we have today when people profess to be Christians but they live like the world and they, they more or less accommodate the world's folly and that's what happened it's, it's when Greek infests the church and that's what happened they tried to force him to eat the pork and they said well and he said he refused and you have to understand it, it's nothing. I'm not talking about don't eat pork. I'm talking about the meaning behind it. You see, and this is what people need to understand today. People say, well, it's no big deal when a governing power or powers of darkness try to force us to accommodate the world, but it is. Because you see, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to be salt to the world which still causes us to be separate from the world, but not isolated from the world. So these are things that we need to understand and stand firm in. To make this story short before we get on with it, is the fact that they tried to force him to eat that, that he was, he was um, not going to eat because it was against their dietary laws. And they said, well, just hang it around your neck or just put it and pretend to eat it so that all the people will follow you. And that's what's happened to many pulpits right now, believe it or not. They say, just go ahead and pretend to do that or pretend to believe that so that everybody will follow you. But Matthews refused to do it and they ended up killing him. Okay, and it, it goes on and on and on. But you can, you can find all these <clears throat> interesting historical accounts. And again, you will not find this historical account in your Bible. You will find it in the Apocrypha, which is not in the, the Bibles that we use today. The reason for is it's not in the canon. It's not in the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yet it is historical. That's why it's not in your Bible. This is actually what you would call the Protestant Bible, which is sola scriptural alone, inspired by God alone. Okay? So that's why you will not find it in your Bibles, Maccabean 1 and 2, but it doesn't minimize the importance of the historical account. And I'm, and I'm using that to parallel it to us today. You might say, Pastor, why? Because if you stop and think about it, that's exactly what's happening here in the spiritual content and context. Amen? So with all that said, we can move right along. Like what I left you with was in John 10, 22 through 30, which spoke about Jesus and dedication, Hanukkah, and uh, we also know it as a Feast of Dedication. But today, I'm going to focus on rededication. I'm going to focus on the light. Now, we probably won't finish it today, but I will finish it on uh, Wednesday. But maybe we will, depending on fast, how fast and, and that it, it flows through, all right? But I'm not going to hurry it. Because it's important that we understand where you are. This is not a, that's the word of Christmas message. I don't do Christmas messages. I do the word of God. To me, the greatest thing that we can embrace is that light that never needs a battery. That light that never needs to be plugged into an electrical source. Because the light that we're plugged into doesn't need anything other 
than itself. Himself, he's all sufficient. Amen. We also have Second Corinthians chapter four, verses three to through ten, which speaks about Jesus being the light that shines in our hearts. He is the light in all seasons of life, not once a year, but every day, to give us hope and courage to do what we're called to do. And you know what that is? In this particular scripture reference, it's to shine out of darkness for his glory. Shine out of darkness. Our text is found in John 8, 12. You remember it's where they brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery to the Lord and everybody wanted to stone her. And Jesus Christ in all his wisdom just turned it right back to them and he says, which one of you are without sin? And he pointed to the eldest or the oldest one, to the youngest. In fact, the oldest to the youngest departed. First the oldest, then the younger one. And you say, well, what's the significance of that? Because the older lived longer and had more time to sin. So Jesus, in all his wisdom, he just put it right back in their plate. And each one in their rightful position of seniority left. And he said, which one of you has the right to cast the stone. He that is without sin, and not one of them could. Amen? So the point came that we're, a little bit later on, then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am. Now, I might be, in a, not that I'm one of them. He says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me, this is powerful. He that follows me, or shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light. Does it stop there? No. Have the light of what? Life. Because you see, light speaks of life. Light speaks, or light speaks of life. And I asked you to write down Genesis 1 through 4. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without void or without form and void. And the very first thing it said after that, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Waters can be, can be symbolic of the word, right? Right? Yeah. So listen, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Father God, I thank you for that, Lord. Brothers and sisters, our theme is this. Jesus is more than just a reason for the season. And I've heard that so many times. Well, he's a reason. Well, I want to disqualify that. Okay? Not, not being cruel or, or arrogant or, or prideful. I just want to disqualify because he's not the reason for this season. Because you see, Jesus is not about a season, he's about the life. Jesus is more. It's your theme. Jesus is more than just a reason for this season. He is the light of every season of life. He is the light of every season of life. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, as we come together to, as your family, Father God. I ask, Lord, that truly you be the light in our hearts that shines out continually in all this darkness around us today, Lord. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be called and redeemed by your blood and called by name to know you more each day, Lord expecting your presence and your power to operate in our lives more each day and every day. And all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Family, my main purpose today as always is to continue in light of God's word, always. And today again, it's to support and strengthen our faith because it must grow, as I said Wednesday and Sunday before, it must grow bigger than our fears. 
And the way it grows bigger than our fears is to constantly reconnect to who He is and who we are called to be. We have a purpose. And the strength that we have, the inner man is strengthened not because of what we want to do, but because of what God has called us to do. And that's especially right now is to be a light and there's so much darkness. I see families wanting to go and see the lights, the celebration, bring their children, see all these lights. And that, that's wonderful in a sense. It's the camaraderie. It's the fellowship. It's the joy. You know, the little kids looking at all that stuff. But you know, our hearts should be plugged into that every day because we are God's children. You know, we don't need to go to the festivities to, to get excited. At least we shouldn't. But I understand it. I'm, I'm not uh, so hard-hearted that I can't understand it. I do understand it. But I have to tell you, I trust God. I don't trust my emotions and my feelings because they're too easily distracted by different things. But God's Word is not. And because of that, the source of life, which is the light of God's word in us, causes other people. Because sooner or later, the electricity runs out. Sooner or later, the bulbs run out. Sooner or later, the batteries run out. Sooner or later, the moment all the preparation for all the holidays and all the separation and celebration and all the com the constant wanting to, to just have a uh, great bread with one another. Remember the oldies and the goodies and all those stuff. As soon or later that day is gold and all the preparation is like just a moment of time. The whole concept of gathered together family and of the lights and lights and all the wonderful things that come about is in itself about God. It's not about anything else. And it's in Genesis. Because he didn't, he didn't just come there and create. He created the light. He created the heavens and the earth. And then he created because he saw the darkness. He made sure that we understand that no matter where darkness is, the, the remedy for darkness is light, whether it be natural or whether it be supernatural. The remedy for this world, the remedy for our hearts is not conducive to what other people can put there. It's conducive to who put his light in our lives, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what we need to focus on. Let everything else become spokes, but not let, don't let the... The, the season that we're in right now be the hope of anything. That be just a small smidgen of a reflection of God's goodness in your life and the opportunities that we have. I want to remind us about three major things. First of all, when we're seeking to restore the altars of our hearts unto God, He gives us the courage despite the odds we face. That's what happened when the Maccabeans so the need to restore the altar in the temple. That temple was made by stone. That altar was made by stone. But we're called to be the temples of the Holy Spirit. And the altars that we have are our hearts. When you look at the feasts of the Lord, these are the feasts of the Lord, the appointed times of the Lord. It's called the Moadim. What I'm talking about right now is not Moedim. It is a historical account of the need to restore that that the world tries to destroy. And it starts with one heart at a time. It's not about this building. It's not about this pulpit. The building and the pulpit are a byproduct of the people's hearts. Whatever comes from this pulpit is the word of God. But this building and who we are comes from what the, the light of God's word is doing in our hearts. The darkness is constantly trying to infiltrate the house of God, but it can't unless the people of God come in with darkness in their hearts. So the first thing I want you to remember is what I'm talking today about is not Hanukkah, but what I'm talking about today is rededication of our hearts on and back unto the Lord God Almighty. What I'm talking about today is if we want to clean up the temple of God, you got to start with the altar of God. And the altar of God is the heart of his people. The word of God says that with their lips they honor me, but their hearts are far from me. And they worship God. 
by the tradition of man and not by the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to embrace God's word. We need to be excited about who we are and can be. We need to understand that it's not just about a season, it is about our life. And you can't appreciate that. You can't put a value on what you're called to do until you no longer can do it. And brothers and sisters, we are here not to burn dimmer, but to burn brighter. We are here to make an impact on more than putting tree, uh, Christmas presents underneath the tree. That is, just, that is just an expression, an outward expression of love and gratitude. But what I'm talking about is something that is every day of our lives. What I'm talking about is when that oil in that temple, when they put forth a small effort, whatever oil they had, they decided to burn it regardless, expecting God to do something. And just like you and I, you may not have a whole lot. You may need to rededicate a whole lot in your life to the Lord. But what you need to realize is what is that needs to be dedicated right now, even if it's a small beginning, if you'll put it on the altar of God, if you'll burn it, if you'll put it up there to rededicate it to the Lord, the Lord God himself will come in the midst of what you're doing and cause you to have a new beginning. Because it burned for eight days, eight days represents new beginnings. They had to see the need. And they had to see the need that the cleansing of the altar was more than just the physical cleansing of the altar. It had to develop in their hearts. They, they needed to know that their own lives needed to be cleaned up. The second thing that I want to bring to your attention is his presence is always there. There's nothing nor anyone greater than him when we seek him. So the first thing, when we're seeking to restore the altars of our hearts unto him, he gives us the courage despite the odds we face. And the second thing, his presence is always there. And there's nothing nor anyone greater than him. And third, when he shows up, miracles follow. Amen. When he shows up, miracles follow. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 19, excuse me, verse 9, part 8, says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Let me say that again. That is 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, part 8. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Brothers and sisters, we are to shine out of darkness. The light of God's knowledge, the face of the Lord God, his, we are to be a reflection of the light. Open your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Chronicles for me. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 10. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 10. When you get there, say amen. amen. The Word of God says this, and if you read up the first two verses, it talks about the ministry that we've been given. Uh, and because of that, we received the mercy to carry out that ministry. And he said, because of the mercy we've given, we faint not. We don't give up. Verse 3 of that same reading says this. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God, small g, of this world. You know who that is, right? Satan, yes have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Why? Why would Satan try to blind the minds who would not receive the gospel? Because of the very next verse. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, 
who is the image of God, should shine on to them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves just servants for Jesus' sake. Now listen. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Where did we see that first? In the beginning, right? In Genesis, right? To shine out, has shined where? In where? Our hearts. To do what? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Remember verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. I thank you for that, Lord. But why? Why is that so important to talk about on this in this particular season? Because of Matthew chapter 5. Go there for me, please. Because no matter the day that we're in. The Lord God doesn't qualify that as a day celebration. He qualifies that as a divine ordination and a calling to his people. The Word of God says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to us. He says in John 8, remember, verse 12, our text, that he is the light of the world. And now he's saying in Matthew that we are the light of the world. Why would he say that? Because he said that when we follow him, we will never walk in darkness. So he's saying that when we as his, as his people reflect Him, then we too are the light of the world. The Word of God says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. What is the, the meaning of being set on a hill? I told you that before. It's about being above. It's about being separated from the crowd, so to speak. Why? So that people can see, not because of you or me, but because of Him of the difference in us as compared to the world that he made, not us, that he made. Up on the hill is about separating us so that people can see, not to bow down to us, but to see the way to go. You see, a, a light on the hill gives light everywhere underneath, right? If you put that light underneath, and the Bible talks about it, you put it underneath something, the light doesn't go up, it doesn't go around, it is, it is kept in a closet, so to speak. It is of no value to anybody. And that's what he says in the next verses to come. He goes on to say this in verse, uh, let's see, a city that is set on, high, on the hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle. Now listen, this is the same thing that I just shared. And put it underneath a bushel. Remember, we are to be up so people can see. Again, not to be worshipped, not that we are anything in ourselves, but because of who is in us, the light that now we are to remember. Now, you are to understand that back in uh, the Maccabean time, back in that revolt, what happened to the light? It had been put out. Did the light just automatically go out or did someone put it out? It was put out. The whole concept of the light, the only place that you and I, every, every place here that the Lord talked about, except when he was talking about himself and us, we, 
it, it, was a, it was a type of a manual lighting. And even in the feast, they had to light the menorah. In the, the stone uh, temple back in Macadamia's revolt, they, the whole point was to light the menorah, right? That's manual type. That, but the place, when we tabernacle with God, there will be no lighting of the menorah because God himself generates the light. And Jesus is saying that today, that all the lights that are going on, everything that is going on, in, at best, they're just counterfeits. You and I are not counterfeits. We are reflections of Jesus. The word of God says here, neither do men put a light, in, uh, light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and give it light to all that are in the house. And then he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your, your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Lord God, I thank you, Lord. I just ask that you open up our understanding, Father God, in the midst of all this, all this rhetoric, Lord God, all this historical, let people see more than what my words are saying. Let them connect to the spiritual message here. Let them see the paralleling and the symbolism of what's going on in our world and in our churches today. Maybe not to that extreme, Father God, but it didn't start at an extreme back then either. It was one moment at a time, one complacent action at a time, one neglect at a time. And Lord, it all starts in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, yesterday evening after sunset, December the 17th is when Hanukkah actually started. Because we know that the time element for the Jewish customs, customs according to God is in the evenings is when it starts a new day. From evening to evening, not morning to evening, but from evening to evening. You have to understand that everything, if you say, well, where'd you get that from? In Genesis. In Genesis. Everything that is truth is built from the beginning. God's word. Remember what we talked about? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. So everything that I'm talking about today is coming full circle, 360 degrees. As I said, yesterday was after sunset, the 17th, which is little Lydia's birthday and my son's birthday. Amen. Is that right? Uh huh. It's an eight day feast, but it's a spiritual application I'm talking about, the new beginnings. The Jewish people celebrated it, and that's why I opened up with a mini series message with that acknowledgement. You know, no matter how we look at different things, God's word is true. It finds and it divides the marrow from the bone and the intents and the contents of the heart. It goes deeper than anything you can possibly imagine. And because of that, we can embrace his word that there's nothing that he won't expose by the light. In fact, he's called us to expose anything and everything. And it can only happen for, by the light. The light of his word exposes. And it doesn't start outside. A lot of people say, well, you know, the word of God will expose all that they're doing in this world. But the word of God works from the inside out. Just like the temple in, uh, back in that time of Hanukkah when they reestablished, rededicated it. You notice they didn't rebuild it from the outside in. Where did they rebuild it from, Brother Kevin? That's right, from the inside out. And they have to recognize the need for that. Just like we do. We have to recognize the need for that in our own lives. We have to understand, and I'm not talking about legalism here. I'm talking about love. I'm talking about appreciation and gratitude. I'm talking about fulfilling your calling. I'm talking about being what you're called to be. Not anything more, not anything less, but what you're called to be. A reflection of his light. And that, that doesn't have to be behind the pulpit. But it has to be the moment that you get up and the moment that you go to bed and all the in-betweens. You say that's impossible. No. It might be improbable for you, but it's not impossible for you. Amen. You just have to decide what you want to do. Brothers and sisters, again, there's a good reason for everything that I'm saying right now. Because I look at it as a spiritual application of what's going on in our world. I look at it as the 
as what's going on with the oppression of the body of Christ, the oppression of the Word of God, uh, and the suppression of the Word of God, and, and all the propaganda that is going on, and, and even the pollution that is coming from many of the pulpits today. You know, it is, it is nothing but perverted, to be honest with you. And God will not allow a perversion from especially the altar of the worship house of God to be polluted, let alone the hearts of his people to be polluted. Willingly. You know, there's, there's a difference between being ignorant and arrogant. And I think we need to be, be careful, make sure that to be ignorant just means that you learn what you need to learn, so you're not ignorant. Being arrogant means that you already know what you need to know, but you still turn your back on it. That's arrogance. And God is not pleased with any of that. So let's understand that the books of Maccabee are not, again, in your canon, but they are very expensive, very uh, detrimental to us understanding and experiences that we will be having that are coming one way or another. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 actually says that we are to represent His holiness. His holiness means being separated from the world. Did not the Word of God say in Isaiah that His Word is higher? His thoughts are, are not as our thoughts. So God Himself is separated from that that He created, right? Well, with us, He's not separating Himself from us. He's placing Himself in the, the light of His flame, so to speak, inside us. There's no separation between us and Him when we live under Him. The Word of God actually says in 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 16, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is this a one-time action? The Word of God says that we are to be as obedient children, not fashioning ourselves according to the former lust in our ignorance. But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Why? Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You say, Pastor, what does this have to do with me? I'm saved by grace through faith. Because I told you I'm civil, uh, symbolizing or using symbolisms here as symbolic references to the spiritual application of our life. I told you that the Hanukkah revolution or the rebellion that came about was because of a stone building and because of a stone altar, a worship house. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it tells us that we are now the temples of the Holy Spirit and that we or to be able to do something with the intent to keep our lives a reflection of a living sacrifice. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, it says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Are y'all with me yet? That's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. It says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? What does it say? Which is where? In you. Which you have of God. And because of that, guess what? You don't belong to you. You are not your own. I am not my own. We are not our own. It says here, Brother Jeff, for you are bought with a price. And because of that, regardless of what people say about grace, this flies in the face of the grace that so many people flaunt instead of walk in. It says here, therefore glorify God where? In your body. Why? Why, Brother Kevin? Why should you glorify God in your body? That's right. Because you are the temple. Your body is what God chose to show and represent His presence. 
You are the reflection, just like the temple of old, the stone building and the stone altar represented the presence of God. God chose not to have a building. God chose the building that he would have that would not be made by man's hand. It would be us. We are the temples. And the altar of our sacrifice must be our hearts. But some people say, well, my heart's after God, but my body's after me. No, that's a lie from the pits of hell. Because your body don't belong to you. No more so that the heart that God gave you belongs to you. It belongs to God. That's why he said, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. He didn't, say, he didn't say glorify God in your spirit and leave it alone, did he? What did he say first? Glorify God where? In your body. Why would he use body? Because that's the visual thing that people see. <clears throat> glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whom? God's. John 17, the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> the Word of God says in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. You know, when I just told that phone to shut up, it reminded me of when, because uh, they told me they found something on the internet, thought I was talking to it. It reminded me of when Peter got in front of the Lord and told him they wouldn't let him do this or that. And, and Jesus looked at him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You say which the things of man and not God. Well, well the phone right there will say which the things of man and not God. So I told you to shut up, all right? It's just so you know, I wasn't talking to y'all, all right? <laughs> Amen. The Word of God says in John chapter 17. Verses 14 through 20. It says, and this is Jesus speaking, I believe to the world, to God, and to his people, his disciples. He says, I have given them thy word. So I know that he was talking to the Father. He said, I've given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they are not of, boom, tell me, the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. That's why we're a hill that cannot be hid. That's why the light needs to be apart. The word of God says here, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. I've heard people say, oh Lord, God, come just take them. But you're not finished. Your work is not finished yet. And that's what the Lord Jesus said here. And I'm sure there were places said, oh Lord, I'm going to go with you. And he said, no, hang on there. He said this, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They, again, he reiterates that. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We are a reflection of him in this world, being not of the world. And then he says, sanctify them. Isn't that what the Maccabeans needed to do on that altar was to rededicate? That means to sanctify or re-sanctify that which was already sanctified. Sanctify them through what? Thy truth. Thy truth. And then what does he say? Bring in all the philosophers. Bring in all the Aristotles. Bring in all the world religion. That is truth. He didn't say that, did he? What did he say? Thy word. Thy word is true. As thou hast sent them into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. And listen, you say, but that's for the apostle. Hold on a second, because he says this. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The same thing that sanctified him. And then he says, neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through what? Amen. Church, we have, if you're truly blood-bought, redeemed child of God, we have been sanctified by his word of truth. 
And we have been cleansed by his blood shed on that cross. And because of this, we are not our own. We are to glorify God in our body and in our spirit. We are to be a reflection of his light. And I wonder myself, how do you try to light the light first to rededicate? Or do you realize that you, if you truly belong to the Lord, your light is still burning. It's just you need to clean off the altar so it can be seen. If you belong to the Lord, the light is still burning. But sometimes we've allowed our hearts to overflow with things that hide that light. And that's what I'm going to address in today. We all have the tendency to allow things to just be set on the altar of our hearts. I know my, my dear wife has a has her tables and her different things where she has certain things set on there. That's what belongs there. And I come along and I empty my pockets and put my watch there and put this there and there. And I, I can see in her eyes, she's looking at it, that doesn't belong there. Well, it's kind of the same thing, but said, uh, Brother Kevin don't do that, right? No. <laughs> it's just something that we need to look at. I'm just using it in a light way because it's such a serious thing. You know, we can, we can do that on our tables and our dresses and get away with it until our wives are, are, start to say, hey, listen, I'm sure Brother Jeff don't have that problem. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is what about you personally? Remove all that from, remove the wives and remove the husbands and all that and just you and the Lord. The table that I'm talking about is not something made by man's hands. It's something given to us by God. It's the altar. It's our hearts. We're called to periodically before it overflows and just totally puts, puts a damper on our lights to clean that and to keep it clean. And the only way that you can do that is to see it for what it is. You can't blame other people. You just need to be diligent to understand. You have to trim your wicks, so to speak, and make sure the oil stays full. You know, I've seen lights, really fine lights come from the store. I have I bought a, a real nice work light to put in the, my shed. And, you know, for when I was doing work late at night, whenever that might be or whatever might go on there. And anyway, I put it, I put it, I saved it really, Jeff, I saved it really nice. I covered it all up and put it in my shed. And I never checked it again. And I went to pull it out. And he used it, and it was, it was cake full of all kind of stuff. I said, oh, that'll just burn away. So I turned, I plugged in the light, it wouldn't come on. And then I looked at the cord, and a rat had gotten in there and took care of the cord for me. So I started thinking, I said, is that what we do with our lives? Is that what we do with our life? We let it cake over. It's still there, but we put it away until we really need it. And then when we bring it out, we're floored when it's not bright like it should be. When you got it from the store, boom, that thing was bright. When we got it from the Lord, our hearts and our, our, the light of God's word in us was bright. And it, it did exactly what it did. It was a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And all of a sudden, we want it to be a light unto our path without it being a lamp unto our feet. It doesn't work. Before you can know where you're going, you have to be able to see your own personal steps, right? The Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. And you get there, say Amen. The word of the Lord says, for you were sometimes darkness. I love it because it didn't say you were sometimes in darkness. It says you were sometimes darkness. But now are you light in the Lord. Now it just stops right there, right? 
don't have to do a thing, right? Just sit there, right? It's kind of like that, that light I bought from the store and I just put it away and just bundled it up and didn't check it out and it ended up being the cord that enabled me to plug into the source of the light. The electricity was gone and even if it wasn't gone, when, if I wouldn't have take, taken care of it, I would have tried to plug it in with all the garbage that was on top of the bulbs, it, it probably it wouldn't have had much of a light. If anything, it had burned, but maybe even caught a fire. So he's saying here, but now are you light in the Lord. And then he says what, Brother Kev? Walk in what? Okay, so it's not all, not enough to be say, hey, I'm light in the Lord, right? What has to happen for that light to be seen? That's right, a reflection of the light of God. Emanate, walk, have action. Walk as children of light. Why? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the fruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. How would we reprove them without being judgmental? Can anybody tell me? Well, let's go to Ephesians that we're just reading from and see what Scripture tells us. It says, what is in verse 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which you are done of them in secret, but all things, in verse 13, are y'all with me? But all things that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatever soever does make manifest is light. So our lives expose the darkness. You don't have to judge. In fact, we're not called to judge. We're called to pray that which we see needs to be prayed for. That's where the judgment is. Not the person, but the very light in us is re reproves the darkness in someone else. And you don't have to say a word. Church, what I'm saying today, in other words, is it's easy to get caught up in a lot of counterfeits of well-being, fabricated joy and well wishes, especially this time of the year, because everyone is looking for a feeling of belonging. And I understand that. And it in itself, it may not be inherently wrong, and it's not, because the Lord God created us to be part of a family, to belong. It was the way that we go about it that's wrong. As I said, in itself, it may not be inherently wrong, and it's not. But those things that we seek after right now, they're counterfeit, because they don't do anything for the kingdom of God that is lasting and life-changing. But instead keep us in the crowd mindset. Instead of being apart from the crowd, we're immersed with the crowd, making no difference. We need to continuously choose God's words and God's way above all else in everything we do through the Holy Spirit's leading in word and in deed. Because that's what we are called to do because that's who we are now. We're not of the world. We say I'm not of the world, but we need to transition from just words and theory and make it applicable to our lives. God is always present, Brother Kevin, especially when we represent Him rightly. And this becomes the truth in our lives as we stay separated, yet not isolated, under Him out of this world. That's why the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. That's why it says this, and people don't understand it, or if they do understand it, they want to throw it out the window as being archaic and of no value. But all God's Word is for us to learn by in all seasons, no matter what. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, it says, And what agreement, are y'all with me? had the temple of God with idols. 
For you are the temple of, again, it says again, what are we? We are the what? The temple of the living God. Is that right? The living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. He didn't stop there, did he? And what? And walk in them. And because of that, he will be our God. And they, talking to us, will be his people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, Pastor, what is the unclean thing? The unclean thing is anything that God does not receive as being good. That's all there is to it. If it doesn't magnify Him, if it doesn't glorify Him, if it's sinful in nature, if it gratifies our flesh outside of the commandments of God, it's an unclean thing. Church, I've heard people say, and y'all may have heard this too, when, when Hanukkah, this holiday, comes by, a lot of people have actually, Brother Rogers said, this is the Jewish Christmas. And that's so, so ridiculous. Because first of all, the Jews don't even believe in that. Uh, third of all, they don't equate that with Jesus in any kind of way. And third of all, they don't believe Jesus as being the deity of being God. So why would they celebrate that as anything? They don't. So when people say it, uh, Hanukkah is a Jewish Christmas, no, it's not. The, the Christmas season that we have didn't come about until 1870s. It was made a holiday then, and then it was brought into religious uh, standards, if you will, or acceptance, merging the two through the Constantine uh, um, Reformation. But regardless of those things, those things are not important to me. What's important to me is that we understand who we are. Yeah. Is that we understand that we're not a, a, about a season. We're a, a people of God every day. That our lights are to shine every day. That the joy of the Lord is to be there every day. Not because of what we receive, but because of who we are and what we have received. Him. In fact, the Word of God says... Uh, open your Bibles to Colossians real quick. Colossians chapter, let's see, I don't know if it's even there, but I'm pretty sure it is. Yes, Colossians chapter, chapter 1, no, chapter 2. The Word of God says here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you, you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Is that what your word has? Okay, my brothers and sisters. So understand that what I'm talking about today is for us to keep choosing the real light, and we will never walk in darkness. Why is that important for me to say that over and over again? Because of the vast darkness that is over the whole world. Again, you don't have to believe me. Just look at the media. Just see what's happening in our schools. Just see what's happening in our churches behind our pulpits and tell me that you can't relate this to the time of the Maccabean revolt. That you can't see the altar of God, the people of God, their hearts being ravished with unholy things, with our thoughts being ravished with ungodly things, with our children being indoctrinated with things that have no, no rhyme, no reason for any of us to even allow our children to be subject to. The reading of things in our, in, in the, the, there's even a, in one particular church, I, I'm sure, I said, so, Protestant church that had gone haywire, where they actually, the, the pastor of the church dressed in drag and spoke the word or spoke a word to the people in drag so that he could communicate better with them according to the times. Now that is sickening, brothers and sisters, but that's the same type of thing spiritually that happened then. You don't have to have an epiphany. Of course we do. You don't have to have a, a, a madman. 
The, the mindset of this world is the madman. The God of this world is Satan. The precept and the thinking of this world is delusional. So naturally they would, they would seek anything to try to fill in the space that they've eradicated. To, to, to keep, you know, I even saw on one of the um, uh, resources that I have that the church, the satanic church, the church of Satan now is bidding for rights to come into the libraries and teach our children too, an alternate. And it probably will be accepted, yet we're not accepted. Now go figure that. You say, Pastor, why would you teach on something like this right now this time? Because it needs to be taught. It needs to be reminded. We need to be reminded who we are and why our lights are not shining the way they should. Because we've allowed the altars of our hearts to be polluted. You may not voluntarily have done it, but with all the different media and with all the, the ways that we as a people, human beings, regardless of being born again or not, we still seek the path of least resistance. We still want to gratify our flesh more than serve God. And because, because of that, you need to take an inventory of yourself, your time with God, your worship with the Lord, how you live your life, whether or not your light is shining. If your light's not shining the way it should, it's not because God is lacking, it's because you need to clean your bulbs. <laughs> Better you clean your altar so your bulbs can shine. Amen. Anybody hearing me today? Amen. So today, brothers and sisters, as I come to the place of stopping, I'm talking not about Hanukkah, but I'm talking about the power of rededication. I'm talking about, first of all, to be clear about who you are. We are God's people. But something had gone wrong with them and their temples of worship. And something has gone wrong with our temples of worship. Theirs is a stone, ours is a flesh. But still, the problem is not the building, it's not the flesh, it's what's inside on the altar of our hearts. God's people had allowed something to happen. They had allowed their temples to be overrun with worldliness. So today, as then, it's about our part as God's people to seek to be functional and then more than functional. We need to be influential as God's people in a corrupt and oppressive society. Something had to happen in this particular setting. God's place of worship had to be, had been polluted more and more until it was completely perverted to the things of God. This called for the rededication of God's temple, but that had to start with the altar as I said before, which to us as God's people represents our hearts. You know why? Because it's where our sacrifices are made. We are living sacrifices. Don't be distracted. I know it's kind of hard, but don't be distracted. Brother Lodge will take care of that in a moment. And I bring you to this. The Word of God says in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 that Paul well said I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice and he didn't just leave it there sister said he said holy and means separated unto him acceptable unto God and he says that is our reasonable service that is Romans Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And in verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect word of God. That's our part. And you see, the Lord God called us on the carpet, his people on the carpet, with Matthew 15, 8, and again in Isaiah 29, 13. The prophet of God spoke the same thing. Matthew, Jesus is the one that used the, what the prophet said in Isaiah 29, 13. But this is what he said, and this is where it starts from. It starts with us saying a whole lot of stuff, 
but our hearts being far from what we're actually saying. The Word of God says in Matthew 15, 8, that Jesus said, first of all, he spoke about what Isaiah said. He said, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What I'm talking about is when we allow our mouths to say a whole lot, but we don't have our hearts in line with worshiping with what our mouths say. We say, Lord, I love you. I do this for you. I turn my back. You know, my wife and I say this. I, and again, we're not setting ourselves up as anything important, but we walk through the journey as y'all do. See, I don't want anything in my life, Brother Brian, that is not pleasing to God. Nothing. I know that the battle is there. I know the challenge is there. I know the world is there. I know the darkness is there. But I don't want the darkness to be inside of me. I don't want anything that is not pleasing to God. And I trust God above all my emotions and all my feelings. My emotions and my feelings take me where they want to go. But God leads me where I need to be. That's why I trust God. The Word of God also says in Isaiah 29. Twenty-nine, thirteen, and this is where Jesus pulled this from. But it's actually he's the one that told uh, the prophet. Remember how this all came about. There was a vision given to the people of God. The vision of all is became unto you as the words of a book, and this is what's happened. That is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, "Read this, I pray thee." And he said, "I cannot." For it is sealed. And that's what is happening in the churches today because of what the oppression and the censorship is doing. It's causing us to seal our books. It's causing uh, Kirk Cameron couldn't even read the Word of God. Many today in the church cannot, cannot share the Word of God because of censorship, and that's wrong. The Word of God says here, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. Verse 12, And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. And that's when this prophetic word came forth. And I say it today, in this time that we're living in, because of darkness, it says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed what? Their heart, not from me, but where? Far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. See, that's where we are today. Spiritually. Our part is to take that, that that we have and light our flame and keep it burning. And God will empower us to rededicate our hearts so that we can be a reflection of that flame in us burning. He will show up again and again and again. We should never, ever despise small beginnings. If you have, see that much of your flame trying to burn in your heart, don't turn your back on it. Put it on the altar so you can see what needs to be cleaned. God will show up and cause you to see clearer than you've ever seen before and stay longer continuously burning so that you can fight against all the odds, all the challenges, all the darkness. Because the more that you rededicate your life to the Lord, the more that He is prominent in your life. He then truly fulfills the word that He said in John 8, 12. He becomes the light 
of your life. Father God, I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that we can come to a place, Lord, to stop for a moment and to take up this message again in, a, in another element, Father God, that you've given me Wednesday. And I thank you, Lord God, that in faith we keep choosing the real life. And Lord, because of that, we will never walk in darkness. Father God, I speak that. I declare that, Father God. I declare that, Father God, and the people of God that I serve, they agree with that. Do I have an agreement with that? Amen. Therefore, what we declare, we agree, we decree, and we can have what we decree. We receive what we decree, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that there's something that you showed me that I will remind your people about as I close today. In Exodus chapter 13, when the people of God were following the Lord, something happened. And I believe that same thing that happened to them wants to happen in your life, in my life, in the body of Christ's life. The Word of God says in Exodus chapter 13 that something phenomenal happened. It says in verse 20 of chapter 13, it says that they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped beneath them in the edge of the wilderness. And something happened, Sister Cindy Lou. And what happened to them is going to happen with us on our journey. It says that the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Listen to the significance of it. In a cloud, he led them the way. And by night, no matter how dark it gets or what the governing powers of this spiritual battle that we're battling tries to implement in our churches and in the temples of the Holy Spirit and on the altars of our heart. He will lead us in the way. And when the darkness grows even greater, he says, and by night in the pillow of far, I will lead you give you light to go by day and night. Regardless, he is the light of life. And listen, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Father God, I thank you for that promise, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that whether it be by the cloud during the day or whether it be by fire during the night, you, Lord, go before us. You are the light of our lives. And you will not remove them, your presence, as long as we follow after you. We will never walk in darkness. In the name of Jesus, I pray and everybody says, Amen. give God all the glory.